at the wheel of his Gragua local slang for an SUV, he sometimes finds a spotty cell phone signal on a highway overpass, and there he sits, often for hours, scrolling through messages. During the day, with no working landline and no internet access, he operates more like a 19th century mayor of Yabukoa, orchestrating the city's business in an information vacuum, dispatching notes scrawled on slips of paper about problems such as bulky generators and misdirected water deliveries that he hands to runners. On the other side of the mayor's favorite overpass spot, one of the generators at the area's biggest hospital has collapsed from exhaustion, and the frazzled staff has stopped admitting new patients. Deeper into the island's mountainous interior, thirsty Puerto Ricans draw drinking water from the mud-caked crevices of roadside rock formations and bathe in creeks too small to have names. We feel completely abandoned here, Cirilla Ruiz said with a heavy sigh. It has been three weeks since Hurricane Maria savaged Puerto Rico, and life in the capital city of San Juan inches toward something that remotely resembles a new uncomfortable form of normalcy. Families once again loll on the shaded steps of the Mercado de Santos traditional market on a Sunday afternoon, and a smattering of restaurants and stores open their doors along sidewalks still thick with debris and tangled power lines. But much of the rest of the island lies in the choked hold of a turgid, frustrating and perilous log toward recovery. When night comes, the vast majority of this 100-mile-long, 35-mile-wide island plunges into profound darkness, exposing the impotence of a long-troubled power grid that was tattered by Maria's winds and rains. 84% of the island is still without power, according to the governor's office and local officials in many areas are stealing themselves, with a sense of anger and dread, for six months or more without electricity. Roughly half of Puerto Ricans have no working cell phone service, creating islands of isolation within the island and cutting off hundreds of thousands of people in regions outside the largest metropolitan areas from regular contact with their families, aid groups, medical care and the central government. Christine Enid Neves Rodriguez, who has set up a community kitchen near the southeastern city of Humacao, has dubbed the new reality Puerto Rico's dystopian future. Accompanying that vision of the future are worries about outbreaks of diseases such as scabies and Zika, which is transmitted by mosquitoes breeding in standing water. Just 63% of the island's residents have access to clean drinking water, and only 60% of wastewater treatment plants are operating, according to figures released by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. In poorer communities, such as the San Juan neighborhood of Carolina and the mountain town of Canavanas, doctors are seeing worrying numbers of patients with conjunctivitis and gastritis brought on by contaminated water and poor hygiene. With electrical and cell phone outages complicating commerce, large swaths of the island, and even many spots within the biggest cities, are cash-only zones, as if credit cards never existed. More than 40% of bank branches have yet to reopen according to the governor's office, and barely more than 560 ATMs are functioning for an island with a population of more than 3.4 million. On the upside, chronic gasoline shortages that plagued the early days after the storm seem to be easing, at least in the larger cities, and 86% of grocery stores have reopened. But the journey to fill the gas tank or the shopping cart can be an exercise in faith and blind courage. In the sprawling metropolis of San Juan, crisscrossed by major highways and multi-lane streets, most streetlights are not functioning. Only a surge of post-hurricane politeness and patience seems to be preventing the morgues from swelling with traffic fatalities. The roads in and out of San Juan are lined by denuded hillsides, their rocky, frayed surfaces exposed to the sunlight. The storm acted like a bloaterch, searing off leaves and stripping away topsoil. A surreal consequence of Maria's transformation of the island's landscape is the lack of shade in one's divine town squares and jungle-like hinterlands. It is enough to make many Puerto Ricans consider fleeing the island for good, even though the thought of leaving a place they love can still seem implausible. What awaits many of them here is protracted subsistence living. 
in places such as the surfer haven of Playa Jobos on the northwestern coast, a woman whose wooden house was blown to bits has taken to living in a disabled food truck outfitted with a hammock. When I think about grandchildren, I know that I don't want this for them, said Lucy Rivera, an unemployed single mother who has crammed nine people, including her disabled mother and mentally ill brother, into a house that lost its roof in the town of Canavanas near El Yunk National Forest. Rivera has no money, and her government assistance cart is useless in the many businesses that have gone cash only. So she sits in traffic for hours in a borrowed car trying to find food and get medical care. On a recent afternoon on one of those choked Puerto Rican roads, cars jammed with children in plastic jugs pulled over to gaze at the ingenuity of Jesus Sanchez, a wiry 74-year-old retiree. Sanchez had fished a six-foot length of PVC pipe out of a ditch in Toa Alta, an ancient town 17 miles outside San Juan. He had lashed it to a forked branch with some shredded cloth and inserted the mouth of the pipe into a crook that began gushing water in the steep limestone hillside above his head. Now, he called to his wife, Ana Marrero Needs. Marrero Needs proceeded to toss plastic jugs, empty containers that once held cranberry juice and canola oil, over to Sanchez, who clung to the muddy slope, slipping and sliding, but smiling. More than two one-half weeks had passed since the storm, and he had not received any aid at their house, where the windows were blown out. But, from the hillside, he drew sustenance, just as he had done for days. If it wasn't for this, how many would have died, he said. The roads narrow as they snake up the mountains, then dip down into the jaw-dropping valleys of central Puerto Rico, passing by town after town where the wind tore roofs off nearly every humble cinder block dwelling, and splintered the yet humbler wooden shacks. Flamboyant trees that once prettied the countryside with branches lit by brilliant red flowers lie by the thousands alongside thick-trunked rubber trees. Stands of bamboo with stalks thicker than the fat end of a baseball bat form archways that scrape the roofs of all but the squattest of cars. Being miles away from the coast, provided no safety to the residents of Moravis, a town of about 30,000, that sprawls over bluffs and into ravines in north-central Puerto Rico. Sarima Rivera, a 31-year-old mother of twin boys, couldn't stand the smell of sweat anymore and headed for a trickling creek south of town.